it's weird to think of Windows 7 as being old. In some ways, it just doesn't really feel like it's that old, and it's like I was just daily driving it yesterday. Other times, you kind of stop and realize, oh yeah, this, this thing's pretty old, isn't it? I just can't bring myself to call Windows 7 retro, yet I think it needs at least a few more years before I would even start considering that. Especially considering that the free public updates only ended like three years ago, and the uh, paid updates for like enterprise users only ended at the beginning of 2023, so it's not that retro yet. But uh, that information still isn't enough to escape the fact that Windows 7 is 14 years old. Yep. I did consider titling this video like the Windows 7 Nostalgia Build, and granted, yes, there is some nostalgia going on here. I do have quite a fondness for the operating system, having used it for quite a long time. But uh, I thought that title was kind of kind of goofy. I didn't I didn't really like it because to me, right now, Windows 7 is just old. That that's it. it it's just old. Um, but I, I still like using it and messing around with it. And well, since Windows 7 isn't getting any younger then, I figured, well, what's a better time than now to build a dedicated computer for it, since I don't really have one, especially not for gaming. And, uh, I guess this will be its early 15th birthday anniversary thing, I guess, I don't know. When I built my Overkill Behemoth Windows XP SLI gaming rig, uh, I knew exactly the era of hardware and like what hardware I wanted to go with for that build. And while that did limit me somewhat in terms of the hardware that I could use, uh, that was part of the enjoyment for me. I found that part of the fun. Now for this build, I am sticking with a particular time period. However, that's more by chance because of the motherboard that I already had, and since I figured, hey, that motherboard's such a great fit, why don't I build a system that kind of would complement it from that time period? And that time period being kind of late 2009, 2010, which is conveniently the same time that Windows 7 launched. I swear that wasn't on purpose, I, I did legitimately get this motherboard, like, years ago for free, and that it just works so well. This is also just a time period of hardware that I've never really gotten to mess around with. You know, I've done mid-2000s stuff all the time, older stuff, and of course some newer stuff, kind of mid-2010s, but never that like late 2000s, kind of early 2010s period. It's just, it's just always kind of evaded me, I guess, uh, until quite recently I didn't have a lot of hardware from then, probably because it was still expensive and too costly to justify just frivolously buying, uh, but nowadays it, it's mostly pretty cheap, so. I also just really like this period of hardware. It's just appealing to me. I've just been fascinated by it for like a while. It's kind of in that like sweet spot where it's not quite modern, uh, but a lot of the stuff is still fairly modern, so it makes it kind of easy to build. This is uh, a build that went very smoothly. Now, how about we start off with the case for a change, since I always seem to start with hardware, uh, so why not start with the case, the thing you're looking at right now? I didn't have any nice cases from, like, the late 2000s or whatnot. Uh, my Antec 900 is already busy, you know, holding my XP rig, and I just didn't really have anything else. I did have this, like, one Corsair case from, like, 2016 that I built my first uh, computer in, but... Yeah, it just, it just wouldn't fit, really, in my opinion. So I just decided to get something new that looks like it's a decade old, and meet the Fractal Design Focus G. I bought this case like a year and a half ago on Amazon, and you can still buy this case on Amazon through third-party sellers, but I don't know for how long you'll be able to do that, since uh, I don't think this case is actually being made anymore. And this is actually my first time ever using a Fractal case. Uh, truthfully, one of my dream cases for a long time, and including for this build, I'd love to have an old uh, Define R case from Fractal, um, but they're trying to buy one secondhand is frankly, it costs too much, so. There's a lot of compelling reasons why I chose the Focus G. Uh, one being the color. I really like this white color. 
Uh, it has a very nice matte texture, unlike the uh, glossy texture of some of the other Focus G colors. Uh, like I know the blue one is really glossy and eh, I, don't, I don't really like the way it feels and looks. Uh, the second is, I'm not really sure when this case came out, um, but the design, it's not totally like something you would have seen in, especially not the late 2000s. Early 2010s, maybe a little bit more so, um, but the, the core design and some of the features are very reminiscent of what you could have expected to see. And if this case had come out in, say, 2012 or something, uh, I think people would have really liked it. Um, but I don't think it would have been, like, earth-shattering, like, this is all, oh, this is a game-changer kind of case, you know that? It's not period correct, but it feels period correct. And of course, it's got very important features for the time period, mainly, you... Mainly that you just couldn't have a build without an acrylic side panel. That's right. No tempered glass here. Don't get me wrong, I, I like tempered glass, but it's nice knowing that I can drop my panel and not have it shatter into a million pieces. And of course, it's still got five and a quarter inch drive bays. Could we please bring them back at least one? Like, I know not everyone needs an optical drive, but I do, or even just for other expansion. Come on, guys, just give us one, all right? And one of the main reasons why I wanted the five and a quarter inch drive bay is because I wanted this Blu-ray drive in there, so I actually have a machine that just always has a Blu-ray drive in it now, so I can rip Blu-rays conveniently, you know? And while software never really got distributed on Blu-ray, uh, there still would have been a reason you would have got a Blu-ray. Uh, streaming video, especially at HD resolutions, was still a very new thing. And if your internet connection wasn't up to handle it, yeah, getting a Blu-ray drive made a lot of sense. Of course, you'd probably want to get an actual Blu-ray player to hook up to your TV, not watch it on your computer. Uh, but, you know, everyone has their own appeals, I guess. But if you were more on a budget, you definitely would have still wanted a DVD RW drive because, well, a lot of games were still shipping on DVD, even though they had, like, online activation and whatnot. Internet connections were not quite what they are today, and you, you definitely would want to install your game still off of the disc and not download the entire thing, so having an optical drive in this time period still made a lot of sense. Now, the case only comes with these two... Now, the case only comes with these two white LED fans normally, uh, but I was able to source a third one. Uh, so I have three matching fans, two intake, one exhaust, and uh, I think they look quite nice. They complement the build pretty nicely. This thing's just gonna blow cold air at me now for the next few minutes. That's lovely. So now for the motherboard, which is really what kicked off this whole idea in the first place when I first got it like a few years ago. I just got given it for free, and uh, that was the only thing I could think of as a use for it. This is a Biostar TA890FXE. Uh, came out in 2010, and it is an AMD AM3 motherboard, and featuring the 890FX chipset. Now, there, there's so much cool hardware you can mess around with if you're looking to build a Windows 7 computer. I mean, you have like six generations of Core i CPU, and like you still even have like Core 2 quads that were perfectly capable of running Windows 7, playing a lot of games. Uh, you got like AMD, Phenom, FX, even early generation Ryzen chips all work with Windows 7 and they work pretty well. I mean, I used like a uh, Ryzen 2000 CPU with Windows 7 for like a solid year and it was great. So definitely don't think you have to be restricted or anything to like what I'm doing. There's tons of different options for you if you're looking to do this. Now, being an AM3 board, you might expect it to be able to uh, use FX CPUs, uh, but you can't actually. You need an AM3 Plus board to use FX chips. Uh, this board can only support Phenom 2s and like the Athlon 2s, and I think there was still a couple Semprons kicking around. Why you would use it in a board like this, I have no idea, but you could. Uh, this board is actually pretty nice. Uh, the VRM cooling, I think, is actually pretty good. Uh, it's better than my AMD 970 board, so that's that's something. And of course, it also supports Crossfire, a 
very much must-have feature that you needed to have. That wasn't supposed to be a joke, by the way. You, you actually would want Crossfire back then. I, I just phrased it weird for some reason. And even the reviews back then said that, well, that, that's pretty, that's a pretty decent board right there. So why not use it? Of course, it's not like earth shattering or anything. It, it's, it's a Biostar motherboard, uh, which I actually don't have any bad experiences with Biostar. They're perfectly okay. It's just, I think most people back then would have went with like an Asus or Gigabyte probably. And uh, speaking of Gigabyte, I actually have two boards I could have used for this. Uh, this is actually an AM2 Plus motherboard with the uh, 790GX chipset, I think. I didn't feel like taking it out of this case, so this, this is the best shot you get of it. Wait, AM3? AM2 Plus? How are those compatible? Well, secretly, they're the exact same socket. Almost. Uh, there is technically, I think, a one pin difference. But this brings us to an important decision that the AMD buyer of the time would have to make. See, the Phenom 2 line came out right as a memory transition was happening. If you're familiar with the pretty recent DDR4 to DDR5 memory transition, well, similar thing was happening back then, the DDR2 to DDR3 transition. And so rather than AMD choosing one or the other for their new platform, they decided, well, why not just support both and let the consumer decide by picking the motherboard they want. And as you can probably tell from the name, AM3 supports DDR3 and AM2 supports DDR2. So it's not actually that complicated. And DDR2 is actually what most people picked back then as even the high-end configs of DDR2 was still usually way cheaper than decent DDR3 at the time, and DDR3 didn't really offer that big of a performance jump, um, unless you went with like really high-end, at least 1600 megahertz stuff. DDR2 1066 with good timings, it was easily almost just as fast as DDR3 1333 with good timings, so yeah, for the cost difference, most people would have went with DDR2. Uh, unless you really wanted like the really high-end DDR3, in which case you were probably gonna pay a pretty penny for that. Funnily enough, in the modern day, the roles have actually reversed. Uh, high-end DDR2 will cost you way more than uh, mid-range DDR3, because 1600 megahertz did eventually become like the mid-range for DDR3, and you can buy DDR3 all day. You'll, you'll come away spending less money on DDR3 for a system like this than you will spending money at Taco Bell these days. So that's the main reason why I chose the AM3 board over the AM2 board, purely out of convenience. And while we're on the topic of memory, I've chosen to go with an 8 gigabyte kit of 1600 megahertz CL9 G-Skill Ripjaws memory. I think this was out in like 2010, it might not have been. I bought this for, I don't know, it was really cheap. Uh, and these ones actually came with a completely separate system that I bought. I actually have two kits now, although these ones have mismatching product dates. So I don't know if I trust them working together. So I have eight gigs in there now. If I ever wanted to, I could upgrade to 16 gigs. Uh, I don't think I would ever need 16 gigs of RAM in a system like this. 8 gigs at the time was plenty. In fact, a lot of people probably would have still been rocking like 4 gigs. So this is totally fine. I'm probably never going to upgrade with this and probably use these in some other system, I guess. And since I've already mentioned that Phenom 2s are the best CPUs you can get for this motherboard, it's probably not a surprise that that's what we're going with. But uh, which one? There's actually quite a healthy amount of Phenom 2s you can choose from. There's the X3s, which are triple core CPUs. A lot of them you can unlock to quad cores, so they're not quite as interesting, but still a triple core CPU. Haven't had one of those in years. You have the X4s with, of course, four cores, and even the X6s with six cores. For a consumer CPU in 2010, six cores? That, that, was, that was pretty cool. And while the X6s are really cool, and I'm not opposed to upgrading to one at some point, those two extra cores really don't make a huge difference for gaming. Games barely were using like four cores at this point. The six threads were really if you needed to do more like workstation tasks uh, alongside your gaming, or if you even just wanted a cheaper workstation, because I don't think Intel was offering more than four cores yet, even on high-end desktop until, until I think like Sandy Bridge? 
or maybe even Ivy Bridge, I'm not sure. So that was a great option for that. Uh, but I've chosen to go with a X4. Pretend that this is a Phenom 2 and not an Athlon 2. I don't, I don't have another one. I've specifically chosen the 965 Black Edition. The Black Edition, of course, meaning an unlocked multiplier, which is probably unfamiliar to AMD users of today where everything is unlocked. But yeah, back then they were still doing the locked multiplier thing on most of their CPUs to, I guess, copy Intel, because that was the cool thing to do, I guess. But they did offer some black editions with unlocked multipliers for easier overclocking. This particular chip is clocked at 3.4 gigahertz, and I haven't overclocked it at all yet, but uh, you should be able to get at least a four gigahertz with one of these. So uh, it's definitely something I'm going to do in the future. The whole Phenom 2 lineup is actually really interesting in my opinion, and I don't really have the time to delve into it here. But for a tiny bit of backstory, uh, the Phenom 2s launched in 2009 uh, to replace the... They weren't bad, the Phenom 1s. They were just too late to the party to actually matter. And uh, these actually held their ground pretty nicely against the older Core 2 quads that Intel was still selling at the time, but going up against the, uh, the new... Core i5s and i7s, especially on like LGA 1366. Yeah, these kind of struggled. And even the uh, later uh, 800 series Core i5s and i7s, they, they still struggled a little bit with. But for the price, uh, these generally offered a pretty good value. It's worth noting if you're looking to buy a 965 that there's actually two variations of it. Uh, in fact, I think there's two variations of most of the original X4 Phenom 2s that came out. There's the original C2 stepping, which uh, for the 965 had a TDP of 140 watts. And then there's, of course, the newer C3 revision that we have in there, uh, which the TDP is only 125 watts. Not really sure what caused the uh, TDP drop so much. The C3 stepping does run at a slightly lower voltage, so I'm guessing it must have improved manufacturing processes or something at that point. But either way, Lower power consumption is almost always better, and usually better for overclocking as well. So I made sure to go out of my way to buy the C3 version. And if you're looking to distinguish between the two versions on like eBay or something before you buy one, uh, the C2 140 watt versions uh, end with DGI in the model number, and the C3 125 watt versions end in DGM. So that's something to look out for. And I've also put on my old Hyper 212 Evo cooler that I used to have on my FX and even my Ryzen for a little while. The Hyper 212 series was a pretty popular cooler uh, back then, so it makes sense to pick one. Uh, this thing is great, and I've never seen the temps on the CPU go above like 53 degrees, like on a full all-core load. Yeah, it, it's amazing how much uh, hotter and power-hungry newer CPUs have gotten. And just like the CPU, there's a ton of really cool graphics cards you can choose from for the Windows 7 time period. Oh, mm. I love graphics cards from this time period. It's just, I don't know why. They're just fascinating to me. I love watching benchmarks and using them whenever I get an opportunity. I don't know why. I just think they're cool. They're a lot cooler than modern cards, in my opinion. And since I'm sticking to that 2010 time frame, uh, there's basically two options I really had. Either an NVIDIA GTX 400 Fermi series card. That would be great right now in the winter, not in the summer. And ATI, very soon to be renamed to AMD, uh, Terascale 2 Radeon HD 5000 series cards. You can probably tell if you have a keen eye that that is indeed a Radeon card. And uh, there's a couple reasons why I wanted to go AMD for this build. I am not opposed at all to trying out like a GTX 480 or something. I think memeing on Fermi is funny, but they're probably actually not that bad. Yeah, I just decided to go HD 5000 because, well, it's more convenient, I guess. And they were first to the party with DirectX 11. The 5870 was the first DX11 card. They beat Nvidia by a few months, and uh, I think that's pretty important. And while I had originally planned on getting a 5870, actually, I have a 5970 that I actually would have really liked to use, except the second GPU just isn't detected for some reason. So it's basically just a really fancy, long 5870. Anyways, 
I was planning on using a 5870 for this build, uh, but they're still hovering around the $35 to $40 mark, especially if you want one with a better like aftermarket cooler on it. Uh, so I just decided to go a little bit cheaper, uh, and I have a good reason for that. I decided to go with the 5850, and I actually got this for only like 20 bucks. Sure, it's cut down a little bit from the 5870, but not that much. And since this is actually the Asus Direct CU uh, version of the card, which has this very nice cooler on it, and it actually has the heat pipes directly contacting the die. I don't know if modern cards even really still do that a whole lot. They, I think they all still have, they just have like a cold plate or especially a vapor chamber nowadays, but yeah, I think that was a new thing for the time. I don't know if this was the first card to do it, but it could be, honestly, I don't know. And because of that, it's actually slightly overclocked, only like 40 megahertz on the core or something like that. But I think it's overclocked by at least 100 or 125 megahertz on the memory. So that's actually a pretty nice improvement and helps uh, close that gap uh, between the 5850 and the 5870. And it still even has a full one gig of GDDR5 VRAM, just like the big boy 5870. So, I mean, this card is great. I love the way it looks. It's very quiet, it runs very cool. I don't think I've gotten it above 62, 63 degrees Celsius. So that's pretty good. And another convenient reason why I'm not going with a top tier card is because, well, I wanna do Crossfire. And while you certainly can do that with a 5870, by all means, that's great. A popular thing to do back then, or, well, I don't know if it was popular popular, but it was definitely a thing people did back then, was you buy a slightly step down card initially for your build, save a little bit of money initially, have a great time, and then a few months later, maybe a year later, once you saved up some more money, go buy a second card, pop that sucker in, and wow, you just got a big performance improvement. Asterisk. Yeah, Crossfire and SLI, any multi-GPU setup almost always has its fair share of caveats and problems, but I definitely am interested in taking a look at Crossfire at some point, so... So I figured going with the step-down card almost makes it feel a little more realistic. Not that people didn't Crossfire 5870s, it's just... I don't know, I like experimenting with stuff like that. Two of these cards and Crossfire should easily blow past a 5870. Frame times... Maybe not so much, but at least the average FPS will be good. Storage, that's a, that, that, that's probably a thing we need. This was also an interesting time for storage. Uh, SSDs were finally starting to become affordable and in capacities that actually were useful. And uh, sure, maybe the average person couldn't quite afford an SSD yet, but at least they were affordable to enthusiasts at this point. And if you were building a nice high-end gaming system like this, you were definitely looking at getting some form of SSD to at least boot Windows on. And this was also towards the end of the lifespan for the high-speed consumer hard drive. Uh, I think they did live on a little longer in data center applications and whatnot, but high-speed hard drives were kind of dying off by the early 2010s. So rather than choose, why not go with both? Because, well, if you wanted to go with an all SSD system at the time, yeah, you were gonna be very, very broke. I would have loved to have gone out and grabbed like an Intel X25 SSD or something from back then, but uh, frankly, paying like 15 to 20 dollars for like 40 or 64 gigs of storage space, I don't care if it's period correct, that still just feels wrong to me. Uh, so I'm just using an old 120 gig SanDisk SSD I had lying around. It is nothing fancy at all. Uh, but 120 gigs was a size that was available at the time, so it is fitting in with the time period. And honestly, the speeds are probably just as fast. Actually, this might actually even be a little bit slower than a high-end, like, Intel SSD of the time. And if you want to buy a modern 120 gig SSD, it's like 10 bucks. In fact, good luck even finding one these days, because they've basically all been replaced with, like, 240s at the bottom end. So the SSD is great for the operating system and for, you know, a handful of games. Uh, but we definitely need a uh, hard drive for, you know, the bigger games and just being able to install a lot of stuff in general. So we definitely want a pretty high performance hard drive. And that's where the Western Digital Velociraptor comes in. 
Uh, if you're not familiar, they were 10,000, yeah, 10,000 RPM hard drives. Believe it or not, there are hard drives that even went up to like 15,000, but uh, this one's only 10, and that's still pretty dang fast. And uh, the Velociraptors were basically just like enterprise server drives that were stuck to a sled sold to the consumer, but hey, I'm not complaining. It's a 10,000 RPM hard drive that they, they sold to us. I mean, that's, that's pretty cool in my book. Uh, this one has a capacity of 600 gigabytes, which was available in like 2010, I think. I think this particular model came out in like 2012 or something like that. It's basically the same drive that came out in 2010, so I, I don't care. Something's gotta power all of this stuff, and uh, I hate how much power supplies cost these days. It's completely ridiculous. And like, even with like the tariffs and whatnot and inflation, and they're still more expensive than they used to be, even factoring in all that stuff. You, you can't just use that as an excuse, okay? Paying like 140 bucks for like a 750 watt power supply, or maybe 850 if you're lucky for that kind of price, like, come on, really? So I had to get a little more strategic with how I was gonna get a power supply for this thing. Uh, thankfully, I got pretty lucky on Prime Day. I found this 850 watt Cooler Master MWE, I think is supposed to mean Master Watt, E for energy, I guess. I don't know, they used to call them Master Watts, I think. A fully modular power supply, by the way. That would have been pretty premium back then. Uh, I got it for like a hundred bucks, so I'm pretty happy. It seems to be working all right, so no complaints so far. I think this thing even supports double eight pin EPS connectors. So that's, that's pretty nice. Not that they'll ever use it on here, but hey, that's nice to have. I think that about does it for the hardware. Not much else to talk about. I'm not putting a sound card in here because by this point in time, sound cards were more or less irrelevant. Well, let's be honest. The onboard audio works perfectly fine. And if you were really serious about audio, you were probably starting to look more into USB DACs at this time. So yeah, sound card, especially an internal one, it eh, didn't really make a whole lot of sense by this point. And uh, the build actually went pretty smoothly. Booted it up the first time, there wasn't really any major problems with it. There was a few minor issues. Uh, this board only has uh, three PWM fan headers, or actually there's only one PWM for the CPU. The rest are only three pins. There's only two of those. And of course I lose the only fan splitter I have somehow when I go to build this thing. So this thing got delayed building for like a couple days while I waited for new splitters to come. So that was annoying, but they, they work now. Uh, another thing is that this board only has a single SATA 3 port. Why it doesn't have like at least two, I don't know. I feel like you should just be able to at least wire up two. Like what, what, what chipset controller was not gonna have like an option for two ports? I don't know, maybe I'm an idiot. Maybe the 890FX can only support the single SATA 3, I don't know, but it's just, it's annoying because they put it flush facing out from the board. Why? Why would you do that? I, I don't get it. it. It's annoying, it makes the cable management worse and I'm mad. Anyways, uh, another really odd thing is that the BIOS loves detecting all the drives as being IDE drives. If you're not familiar with uh, SATA, especially back then, there was often a SATA mode you could enable to uh, basically use as like a fallback in case you didn't have the proper AHCI driver and your OS was just freaking out about, uh, there's no hard drive, I don't know what to do. So you'd flick it into IDE mode as like the last ditch cope and uh, then, then it would work. But for some reason, Except for a single SATA 2 port, if you plugged anything into that, it would detect it as a proper AHCI SATA drive. All the other ports is like, no, nah, no, nah, it's just IDE. What? This stumped me for like a good few hours trying to figure it out, and then I figured, you know what, screw it, I'm just going to install Windows, and uh, Windows detected it perfectly fine as SATA drive, so I think the BIOS is just stupid. And uh, even the speeds are about what I'd expect, because I have the SSD plugged into the SATA 3 port, obviously, and that runs at full SATA 3 speed, so I don't know why the BIOS thinks they're IDE drives, but it's not worth me uh, worrying about it anymore. The third was that any time I tried to enable the emergency shutdown temperature in the BIOS, 
which I think I set at like 85 degrees. Not that this thing would ever get to that unless I just, you know, stopped the fan from spinning or something like that. Anytime I'd enable it and then save it and reboot, uh, it, would, it wouldn't turn back on. And I have to reset the CMOS. I don't know why. Uh, I updated the BIOS and that fixed it, so there must have been some bug in the BIOS, but I think it was actually misreading the temperature sensor on the CPU and actually just shutting off the computer because it thought it was overheating. And uh, the fourth and final problem is uh, cable management. I forgot on cases of this era that the cable management was only like kind of there as a feature yet. Trying to cable manage in this thing sucks. You have about that much room in the back panel that you can manage your cables with. And of course I have big, thick, flat cables that wanna not lay flat. And uh, yeah, trying to cable manage all that, not fun. I barely got the back panel on and I never wanna take that thing off again because it legitimately took me like three minutes to figure out how to put the panel back on. Just trying to squeeze it all down. And the worst part is when I do Crossfire eventually, this 5850, I'm gonna have to add us another PCI Express cable. <laughs> Oh, I gotta do that all again. And I gotta add a Molex connector too, I think. I, I probably do. That's usually what that's for, is if you're doing a multi-GPU. Gotta have extra board power. Why you can't get it from that, I don't know. But that's a problem for future me to deal with. But now for the main event. Windows 7. Ah, oh, Windows 7. Not gonna go into like a full retrospective or anything. There's people that have done it better than I ever could. But man, this truly was the last great version of Windows. I mean, personally, I liked 8.1, assuming you install Classic Shell. It was actually pretty fast and responsive. But as far as default experience, man, I, Windows 7, man, was just, if I could daily drive it again, I'd do it in a heartbeat. The aesthetics, that lovely Frutiger Arrow inspired design. We didn't know how good we had it then and how bad things would get. And I've even used a legitimate copy of Windows 7 Professional. That's right, no piracy here today. I'm still technically breaking the the user license agreement because uh, this is an OEM copy of Windows 7, so officially speaking, it, it's still not valid because of the system, but I don't care. I even have the product key sticker. It was never stuck to a computer. I still have that. You bet I stuck it to this thing. No, you're not gonna get to see it because I'm not giving you my product key. You bet. You bet I put it on the back panel. Uh, I should have totally put it back up here too. I didn't realize there was that big of a space there. Oh well, it still works down at the bottom of the side panel. It still looks nice. I guess I could have gone with like 7 Ultimate if I really wanted to, but truthfully 7 Ultimate feels really pointless. In fact, way more pointless even than Vista Ultimate, and that was already kind of grasping at uh, being useful. Yeah, just get 7 Professional. It's basically just as good. This copy has Service Pack 1 included, the only Service Pack ever released for Windows 7. Uh, I've never used RTM Windows 7 before, so I'm not really familiar with what the differences are. Uh, if any of you used RTM Windows 7 back in the day, feel free to comment. Let me know if there's any major differences between the two. This next bit is probably going to be a little controversial, but I am not installing any updates for Windows 7 except for stuff that I actually like legitimately need, like DirectX runtimes, Visual C++, .NET Framework, stuff like that. But as far as the regular security or feature updates go, not doing it. In my personal experience and opinion, fully updated Windows 7, it, it just seems to lose a little bit of snappiness and speed. I don't know what it is. It, it's just not quite as good as a base Service Pack 1 Windows 7 install. Like, I've actually seen this system. It, it doesn't happen a lot, but I've seen it idle at 760 megabytes of RAM usage. You would never get that on fully updated Windows 7, let alone any post, you know, Windows 7 OS. Like, man, that is great. Even modern Linux distros wish they were that low. Although I'd say usually it idles more around the 850 megabyte mark, which is still really good. But you would definitely be struggling to see like under a gig of RAM usage on fully updated 7. And not to mention, after Windows 10 started coming out, they started sneaking telemetry into the updates in order to try to get you to update. Now they're just, you know, sneaky little telemetry bits in there. And sure, you can avoid those updates, but 
it's annoying to have to manually pick through them and all. Not to mention, it takes like takes like eight plus hours if you want to actually install all the updates, uh, at least in my experience, even on a fast system like this. So it's just not worth it. I'm not taking the system online really that much. I'm being careful with it. It's not like as soon as you plug this into the internet, you hook it up to your network, like, oh my God, oh no, it, it's gonna get the viruses. It's gonna, it's gonna kill my network. It's gonna do everything bad. Don't listen to the fear mongering people that'll tell you to do that. It just don't be an idiot. That's it. Just don't be an idiot and you're fine. Okay. And do you really think if I installed all the updates, I'm still protected? It hasn't had updates in like almost a year. And those are the paid updates. The free updates, three years. You're still three years out of date anyways. It's unsecure if you fully update it. So why even bother updating it in the first place then? Just watch what you're doing if you're gonna take this thing online. I know that was a bit of a rant. I've always wanted to rant about that. I hate any time I see anyone freak out like, oh, it, it's so unsecure, you're gonna have viruses, you're gonna get your credit card stolen. Like, no, I'm not. I didn't really do anything special for the drivers. Uh, just installed like the latest chipset and all that kind of stuff and whatnot. Uh, for the Radeon cards of this time, there are two different drivers you can choose from. There's the older Catalyst 15.7 uh, driver, and then there's the newer Crimson Beta driver, which is like 16.2.1 or something like that. Supposedly, the Beta drivers are actually pretty stable, and a lot of people have actually gotten pretty good results with them. Uh, but I just decided to stick with Catalyst because I think the interface fits you know, a little better with the time period. Now, this next part was originally going to be a longer kind of detour and rant, uh, but I've decided to trim it down so this video isn't insanely long because it probably already is gonna be. Uh, but the main point that I wanted to bring up is, is that after the Windows XP era, I think retro builds going forward, not for like XP and older kind of stuff, but like for newer stuff, like when people want to start building more Windows 7 computers like this, or maybe Windows 10 computers and whatnot, uh, there's going to be a very serious issue, and that is, how do I get games for this? Yeah, Windows 98, XP era, sure, you can get tons of those games on, like, GOG or something like that, or you can go buy the discs for them. So that's totally fine, but for Windows 7, you gotta think, even if they were, you know, physically distributed so you could run it off your optical drive, they still have online activation. Pretty much every game past, like, 2008 started using online activation. And, you know, if that code is already used up or the servers don't work anymore or it's some ancient like Secu-ROM or safe disk or whatever they are thing that doesn't really work anymore. Games for Windows Live. That and digital distribution was just starting to become really, really common. I mean, Steam was getting a lot of traction. While I like Steam, I don't like their DRM practices. And if you think, oh, well, I, I can just use Steam, yeah, Steam's ending support for Windows 7 and Windows 8.1. January 2024, so by the time this thing comes out, you got weeks left. And while sure, it might work for a little while, like it did on XP when Valve ended support for Steam, it doesn't work for me anymore on XP. I can't get it to work. Maybe you're still lucky and you can, but you're gonna get, what, maybe an extra year? Two years, maybe, if you're lucky? on Windows 7. So you're gonna have kind of a dilemma how you're gonna get games. Thankfully for the Windows 7 era currently, there are a decent amount of games from that time period available on like GOG. For example, the Bioshock Trilogy, Mirror's Edge, Fallout New Vegas is even on there. Pretty cool, you got the Batman Arkham games. You got like tons of Lego games too, if you wanted to play those. Dragon Age Origins and like Stalker. All that stuff you can get on GOG DRM free. As soon as you download it, it's yours forever. This is not a ad for GOG, I swear. But uh, if the game you want to play is not available on GOG, or heck, it might not even be available on Steam anymore. I mean, games just get delisted because of license issues. Like you can't buy, say, Driver San Francisco or Dirt 2 anymore. So if you don't have them already in your Steam library, you can't go out and buy them. Let my, I mean, you can get them on console, but if you want to play them on PC, you're out of luck. If you want to be official, get your games legally, you can have to go through GOG or I guess download them off Steam on your modern computer and then crack the DRM yourself and copy it on over. 
and at least for now you can still play a lot of these games fine on like Windows 10, Windows 11, but as time goes on that compatibility is going to break and using older hardware with older operating systems is, it's going to start to become more important than you probably would think. I mean, same thing happened with XP and Windows 98, so something to keep in mind. But enough of all that doom and gloom stuff, let's just enjoy the machine for a little while. And I was a bit worried that the system might be a little underpowered for like the really high-end demanding games of the time, especially considering that the CPU and the GPU weren't like totally top of the line and whatnot. But I was still surprised at how well the system actually, you know, held up. Bioshock Infinite, for example, while not running at max settings, it was still like high settings and it was getting well over 60 FPS and that's, that's pretty impressive. Worth noting that I am playing all of this at 1680 by 1050 because uh, that's the monitor I've chosen to hook up with the, uh, the setup. That was a pretty common sort of in-between resolution, you know, 1080p or 1920 by 1200. Those were definitely the very high-end resolutions, uh, but 1680 by 1050 was a nice in-between, you know, not quite as bad as like 720p or something. I'd go more in depth with the performance and uh, maybe we'll do that in a future video, especially if I do the Crossfire stuff, because uh, you can bet as soon as I do that, there's gonna be a video about it. But yeah, at least for now, it just runs the games. It runs them pretty well. I don't really have much to complain about here. This system works pretty well, honestly. And there's a lot of games from this era that I've actually been pretty excited to play and try out, like Bioshock 2 and Bioshock Infinite. I haven't played those yet. I've been waiting to save them for this. Here's Edge. I used to play that all the time on the 360 back, you know, going over to my friend's house. So I'm super excited to you know, actually play through the game and finish it. I even decided to give Minecraft a go on here. Uh, I just used Betacraft to install some older versions of the game. And uh, it's weird to think that in like 2009, when a lot of this hardware was coming out, 2010, the game was still in its like alpha days. That's, it's weird when you put it into that perspective. But yeah, this early days of Minecraft, there were people playing it on systems exactly like this. Uh, I mainly messed around in like beta 1.7 because I just enjoy it. That was also the first version of the game I ever played. But yeah, it runs it pretty well. Aside from the frame times, of course, that's always an issue on Java Minecraft, but runs it pretty well. Oh, uh, this system's 14 years old. That also means Minecraft is 14 years old. And now the big question kind of an important one that I'm sure a lot of you have been probably thinking about and wondering about. Why do all this? It's not like DOS or Windows 98 or even XP where there are legitimate benefits to, you know, building an, you know, an old computer with period correct hardware because, you know, maybe there was features that the hardware supported that you can't really get on modern systems, you know, like Glide or Sure, you can emulate it and whatnot, but it's just not the same. You know, you want to mess around with the real hardware and whatnot. With Windows 7 stuff, there's just, well, there's there's not as much really to drive you to build this, at least for now. Again, like I said, the games mostly still all work on Windows 10. I'm not really aware of any major compatibility problems. Uh, if anyone is aware, please let me know. I'd be interested to know what games, again, from the Windows 7 era, you know, XP stuff runs fine on Windows 7 generally, uh, but I'm looking for like games from like the early 2010s, late 2000s that don't really work well on Windows 10, but will work well on Windows 7. I'm, I'm curious if there are any right now. I guarantee as time goes on and as Windows updates and gets <clears throat> worse, that compatibility is gonna break and uh, uh, real hardware is gonna start becoming more important, but for right now, at the current time, there's not a huge reason to build a system like this. At least if you're just looking to play the games. Now, if you're like me, and you just love tinkering with hardware and whatnot, this is great. This is a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun building this and using it, and I'm going to get a lot of enjoyment out of it. It's a, kind of a nice change of pace, because nothing went seriously wrong with it. Uh, I... Windows 98 has abused me. But if you just love enjoying messing with hardware, absolutely go for it. Now, building another machine is probably a problem if you have limited space, but 
There is one little secret about this system. In fact, most of these early Windows 7 era systems, uh, even going up to like 2013, 2014, in fact, you can install XP on them. Basically, every, everything in this computer is fully supported with XP drivers. I think NVIDIA supported drivers up until like 2014. Same with Intel. You could build like a Haswell system with like a GTX 980 and have full XP support if you really wanted to and have Windows 7. You'd have the best of both worlds. On a system like this too, same thing, dual boot XP and 7. You can have an all-in-one machine. You're gonna be just fine. You're gonna have a great all-in-one system. That's a really cool plus to doing something like this. Uh, you know, maybe build a little bit of a later machine like this if you're looking to build an XP machine so you can also do Windows 7 stuff. It, it's just a nice thing to keep in mind. And also a lot of this hardware now is starting to get pretty cheap. Again, like I got these both of these motherboards for free because people were just throwing them out. And a lot of the other hardware, again, like 20 bucks for the graphics card. I think I paid like 10 bucks for the CPU or something like that. You know, Intel hardware as well, unless you're going like probably Haswell or newer, uh, not gonna be that expensive. Like I said, you can even get like Ryzen, like first and second generation Ryzen to work with Windows 7, like there's drivers available for it. It works, like that still blows my mind because you think, oh yeah, Ryzen, that's modern. Yeah, so even if you have like old Ryzen stuff laying around or old FX, old i7s and whatnot, you probably already have enough hardware to build one of these things or you can easily go find one. Like, and heck, there's a lot of Dell Optiplexes getting thrown out probably right now. Go snatch one of them up and put a graphics card in it. You're gonna have a great time. So for the average person just looking to play the games, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense right now. But if you're a tinkerer and you're like me and you just really love messing with old hardware and whatnot, absolutely go for it if you can afford it or you can find the hardware for it that's not that expensive. Don't dump a ton of money into this, obviously, but you know, if you can, why not? But I think for the average person to really see value in something like this, probably give it another five years, I'd say. By then, I think the compatibility is gonna start becoming more of an issue. I guess I don't really have much else to say about the system. Uh, my voice and my vocal cords are getting very, very tired. I don't think I've ever spoke this much in one session before for a video. I've been recording for way too long, like well over an hour plus, and uh, I definitely need to give my voice a break. But uh, yeah, there's definitely gonna be some more in-depth videos probably on this coming sometime, hopefully soon. Again, doing like the crossfire thing, probably overclocking the CPU and whatnot. But uh, this has been a really fun experience and man, I guess I'm like kind of the first person to do like a Windows 7 sort of retro video, I guess. Not that I want to call it retro, but yeah, I guess I'm kind of the first, right? Uh, hope you guys liked the video. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed the new set. I'll get out of the, the void at some point, but for now, it, it's what I got to work with, okay? Have, have a good one. Ooh. That was a long one.